everybody. Welcome back to Shannon's Lumber Industry Update. Today, it's episode 46. And today I'm going to be starting a discussion about wood movement. I've kind of teased this for the last couple episodes, asking for questions, and you guys definitely answered. I've got a lot of them, so much so that I'm not even going to try to address them today. I'm going to save that for its own episode. I might have to do two episodes because there are a lot of questions. And certainly I got a lot of questions that kind of repeated on the same thing, but I was really excited to see a wide variety of them. So um, I, I want to really break this into a kind of Q&A topic or Q&A center topic because wood movement is very, um, it's contextual. You know, we can talk about the basics of wood structure and wood movement, and I'll do that today. But to really understand how to deal with wood movement, you need to kind of put it in the context of certain projects. So thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions, who sent in anecdotes about wood movement. I think it will help us to kind of crystallize it all and get a better feel for it moving forward. So that being said, again, thank you to everybody who sent in emails. If you are still interested, you know, it's going to be several weeks before I get a time to uh, record the, the Q&A version of this. So please keep sending in those questions. You can go to lumberupdate.com. There is a, a, a contact form, a question form there that you can submit your questions. You can hit me up on Instagram. Um, I'm at lumberupdate there, or you can just email me at lumberupdate at gmail.com and ask your questions there. And of course, ask questions about anything. But if you do have wood movement questions and you want to get them on the show, you better act quickly because I will be recording uh, pretty soon on, on that particular episode. And as always, I, I want to thank uh, those of you who support the show on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lumber Update is where you can go to get the details on that, how to sponsor the show. I have had some people ask me if there's a way to do kind of a one-time coverage. Well, Patreon does actually allow that. You can do either subscribe for you know a small monthly amount, or you can do an annual amount, or you can just do a one-time donation. That's all there if you're interested in supporting the show. By all means, I greatly appreciate it. So thank you to those of you who have already done that. So I wanted to start off um, with a little bit of industry news. I've spoken recently about you know, the, the price increases due to COVID. And since that last episode, the, the latest Harvard re Hardwood Review report has come out. And yeah, um, we're seeing a lot of increases across the board in domestic hardwoods. It's interesting because I've spoken in the past about how cherry has really gone down in price. Well, I actually think it's starting to rebound. And we're seeing price increases anywhere from like 12 up to 18% in four quarter, five quarter, and six quarter cherry. Eight quarter cherry is still kind of, well, it's a little bit on the increase, about 7% up, but it's, it's holding steadier more than the others, which makes sense because cherry being more of a furniture cabinet wood, uh, the thinner uh, cuts are certainly more popular. But yeah, 18% uh, in some instances, an increase on that. Um, Interesting, hard maple is up like 17% across most thicknesses. And hard maple has always been kind of undervalued. I mean, there's so much of it, first of all. It's kind of a ubiquitous hardwood that gets used a whole lot, but it's always been treated more as a commodity, similar to something like poplar, where it never really had that high of a price to it. And I'm wondering if just the push in the, you know, the COVID push in production has caused uh, hard maple to actually start to correct. Some of the hard maple prices you see, you know, several months ago had been the same for decades. So I don't know. That actually could be a good thing if we start to see hard maple correct a little. Poplar, well, poplar started to climb as well. In some instances, four quarter poplar is up 12%. Uh, the eight quarter stuff is also up 12%. This is a direct reflection of COVID and the inability to just produce. There's just not enough people around and the demand has been really, really high on this. Now the oaks, red oak and white oak have been super hot for several years now. Now we're starting to see the pinch on that white oak is up 19% right now. Um, well, four quarters up 15%, uh, but the really common five quarter white oak is up 19%. And we're seeing 16, 15, 14% on, on the other six quarters, eight quarters, 10 quarter thicknesses. Red oak is just below that, about 13% in four quarter and 10 to 12% in the other cuts. So again, uh, major increases there. And that has been going on month over month over month. We're seeing those increases. Lots and lots of demand for red and white oak. 
Walnut, <clears throat> walnut has been a premium species for quite some time, but it has taken another spike, 15% uh, up on the eight quarter stuff, 12% up on the six quarter, five quarter, and four quarter. So those are just kind of the, the primary domestic species, the commercially available domestic species. There are some minor increases in some of the other secondary species, but there's not enough of a trade to really start to, to recognize any particular trend. These are kind of the major ones where we're seeing all of those spikes. So yeah, you know, not, not to be the bearer of bad tidings, but this is what we can expect to see happening for, for quite some time as COVID continues to press the supply chain. More importantly, on these price increases, this is driven by the supply chain issues early on, way upstream, like less people in the forest felling material, less people working in the sawmills, less sawmills open, less material being cut from log into board. Um, this is before we even get into the shipping logistics issues that I was talking about uh, last episode. So moving on to other things, uh, Jay actually shared a video with me that I thought was pretty cool. It's uh, kind of the journey from a raw bamboo coulm, I think that's called, C-U-L-M. I'm not sure where I've got that little bit of trivia from. I think that's from my bamboo fly rod days. I think it's called a coulm. You know, the round part, <laughs> the tree part of, of, of bamboo, even though it's not a tree. I know that. It's a grass. But the journey from the coulm down to actual strips into uh bamboo plywood and bamboo uh, boards and, and sheet goods. And, you know, everybody likes the how it's made type videos. But this one I thought was particularly interesting because you will notice, and I've talked about this in the past, you'll notice about the double um, kiln effect. In fact, one of it is actually steaming. And then the second round is actually drying. And they're injecting steam, certainly to push some of the impurities out of it to kind of give you the same idea that you do with steam beech or, or even walnut for that matter, to get a more uniform color. But it's also bringing everything up to a constant moisture level. And then they're putting it in a kiln and drying it down. But it is particularly interesting to watch. So Jay, thanks for sharing that. I will embed that in the show notes as well. And then I had a little bit of feedback from Joel on uh, the color change episode a couple episodes ago. Joel says, hello from Finland. I have a question regarding the last topic about wood changing color. I have some poplar from a big old log with lots of colors in it. I've seen many pictures on the web of tan poplar where green turns brown and all that good stuff. But when I tried it here during the summer days when it's hot and the sun barely even goes down, nothing happened. According to what I've read, a few hours should be enough. Do you have any theories on this? Altitude is uh, altitude. Latitude is 65 degrees north. He said altitude, but I'm pretty sure he meant latitude. Anyway, um, uh, thank you, Joel. Appreciate that. Now, it says Joel in the question, but then he signs it Joe. Huh, whatever. It's Joel. We're going to go with Joel from Finland. So if you guys have ever seen a picture of a rainbow poplar, if you haven't, Google it. Poplar is one of those species that can go really crazy uh, with a lot of different colors, oranges and reds and pinks and greens. Most of the poplar you see has that green and it turns kind of more of a creamy brown color. Well, when you run into rainbow poplar, the reason that you're getting a lot of those colors is extractives in the wood. For whatever reason, that particular tree has a large amount of resin, a large amount of mineral deposits, a large amount of stuff, chemical compounds in that particular tree that causes that rainbow color. Well, when you put something out in the sun and that color does, does change, there is a chemical reaction going on there as those chromophores are broken down to mellow out the color to kind of make the color more homogenous. But the more stuff that's there in the first place, the more chemical compounds that are there causing that wild color, just the more time it's going to take for that color to mellow out. And it might not mellow out the same or to the same extent as you might see of a board that, that is less wild and color fresh from it. The other thing is if the board is still, he doesn't say, he says he got it from, from a big old log. That tells me that it might not actually be dry enough. If you've ever sawn up or seen a log that's been freshly sawn, the color is very, very different when the wood is wet. Obviously, think about anything. You pour some water on it, it changes color, right? It darkens to somewhat as more moisture is injected. So there may still be quite a bit of moisture in these boards that will also be kind of um, reflecting and, and self-moisturizing some of that chromophore breakdown that you're seeing. So it could take a little bit longer. If this board is dry, if it's already been kiln dried and that's not really a factor, then I'd be willing to bet you it's just a higher amount of 
of um, extractives in the wood itself that's causing that color to be so wild in the first place, but also causing it to take a little bit longer for that to mellow out. Frankly, I think if you've got a piece of rainbow poplar, embrace it and try not to let the color fade on you because that stuff is really, really cool looking. And poplar, well, it's kind of a dime a dozen. Well, certainly, I just said the price went up a little bit, but it is still a relatively inexpensive hardwood. And if you really want um, a more unified look, it's cheap enough to go and buy some more. That one of a kind rainbow stuff, use it for what it is and don't try to you know, blend it into something else. That's just my opinion. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. This will be the same with any species. It's gonna have a large amount of extractive of extractives in it. And that can vary from board to board, from tree to tree, from hillside to hillside. Thank goodness wood is an organic material and it's gonna look different from one board to the next. Which brings us to the conversation of the day, the main topic, wood movement. And I do want to lead by reiterating what I just said. Wood is an organic material. It's a plant, right? Every single board you run into is going to behave differently. So we can talk about wood movement and some general ideas, but there's always going to be a situation where you just scratch your head and go, I don't know what the hell just happened. Like it should be moving this way, but it went the opposite direction. And hallelujah, wood is organic. It keeps us on our toes. It's what we love about it. What makes it look unique is the fact that every single board is unique. There are a thousand and one variables that can affect how a particular board may move. And you may be able to trace that board back to a log. Say you started with a log, maybe you sawed it yourself and you can pull all the boards from that particular log and get this great grain and color match. And you may find that those boards are gonna move differently. Even boards like next to one another in the stack, if you kept it all in a numbered flitch and you'll find that boards one and two move differently. And, and boards one and 12 are probably gonna move differently. But it's there's so many things that can affect this. So it's important that you recognize you have an understanding of wood movement and the, and the, the structural reasons why wood moves, but be prepared to just laugh and say, I don't know what just happened. Like it's wood, shrug your shoulders, it moves, get over it. Um, you know, the, the important thing that we need to worry about when it comes to wood movement, I don't even wanna say worry, because I think too many people actually worry that their project's gonna explode. Wood movement is a perfectly natural thing and it's not evil. If you understand that wood is going to move and you build so that wood movement can be allowed to happen, there's no reason to be afraid of it. And there's no reason to worry that this board could be, you know, some maverick wild card and it can move totally different from the other boards in the stack. As long as you have allowed for wood movement, everything will be fine. Which brings me to my next point. There's a difference between restricting wood movement and preventing wood movement. If you take a board and you screw it down to something that doesn't move, like a steel base, you are restricting, it's a, you, are, you are preventing the wood from moving. But if you take that same steel base and maybe you've got slotted holes in it that those screws run through, now you are restricting the movement and that board will still be allowed to expand and contract because those screws slide in those slotted holes. But they are also holding it down to the flat surface of that steel frame. So it's restricting the board from cupping, but still allowing it to move across its width. This is a very, very important thing. And, and you know, anybody who's built a table understands that this is generally, we have all kinds of ways of attaching a tabletop to a base to allow that expansion and contraction to happen. If you don't allow that expansion and contraction, bad things will happen. The board will find a way to expand and contract. Cracking can occur, buckling can occur. It can even warp a base out of shape and cause the whole table to rock on the floor because that top has, has not been allowed to move. Now you may say, well, I don't want that top to cup at all. And that's why we talk about restriction versus prevention. Allowing that wood movement, that slotted screw hole on the base to be there will allow for that. Things like sliding dovetails. It's a little bit more advanced method, but certainly sliding dovetails dry fit into the bottom will keep that board perfectly flat because of the long grain beam structural strength of the dovetail key, keeping the tabletop or whatever the panel flat, not allowing it to cut, but still allowing it to expand and contract across its width. So just think about that. If you take nothing away from this, don't be afraid of wood movement. Just understand what is going to move and build to account for that. 
Now, how much movement do you account for? Mm, that's some things that we can get into a little bit. And I've got some really good questions about that that will be coming up in a future episode. But first, let's break down the structure of a tree. There are different structures between hardwoods and softwoods and different structures with grasses like, like bamboo that I brought up earlier. We're going to focus on hardwoods, I think, the most because they're, they're a little bit easier to, to kind of visualize and we're talking in an audio format here. Just know that softwoods are going to move the same way, but they don't have some of the same internal structures. So look at the cross section of a tree. Look at the cross section of a log. You've got a big round and you've got concentric circles. Those are the growth rings, right? And they say every growth ring is one year of, of, of growth. Well, when you have a tree, have a log that is growing in the forest, the strength of that tree is along those fibers. They're incredibly strong. Those long grain fibers that run from the roots all the way up into the tippy top of the tree. Those are flexible, yet incredibly strong. And this is what allows a tree to sway in the breeze and not snap under you know, a really bad gust of wind. Not to say that it, that doesn't happen. You take a high enough gust of wind and you will snap a tree. But generally, when a tree does snap in like a hurricane, you'll find that it snaps along a branch or near some sort of imperfection that caused a deviation in that long grain. Look at any board that has a knot in it and you will see all the grain flowing along the board and flowing out and around that knot. Um, that is a weak point in the grain and if you're gonna tr see a tree snap, it's gonna be there. And that's the key. Those long grain fibers are really, really strong and they do not allow for compression along their length. So wood does not move, I shouldn't say doesn't move, it does move, but it's a negligible amount of movement along its length. So you've got a board, the board has a thickness, a width, and a length. You don't really have to compensate for movement along its length because those long fibers just don't really compress. They are designed to be the most, the most, the most strongest, the strongest direction of force. Take any board, and you know you can take that board and kind of flex it over your knee. If it's wide enough, you might be able to flex it across its width. But if you stand that board on end and push straight down on it, you'll see deflection along its length. But if you were to secure that, like push it up against a wall so the deflection can't happen, the bending can't happen, and try to push straight down on the end grain, nothing's gonna move. That is the strongest direction of the board and therefore the strongest direction of the tree. Um, that is because those fibers, well, the fibers run along that, the structure, the actual microscopic structures, everything is stacked on top to allow um, no expansion and contraction there to allow the strongest structural dimension of that particular board. So that's the first thing. Wood, for all intents and purposes, does not move along its length. And the more you can embrace and get those continuous long grain fibers, the stronger that piece is going to be. Go back to the episode I did on riving and splitting your wood, and you can talk a little bit more about how that riven wood ends up being so much stronger and so much stronger in bending as well because you've got continuous long grain fibers. The next thing is wood is an isotropic. It does not move equally in every direction. Isotropic would be it would move equally in all directions. Wood moves more across the fibers than it does uh, certainly along its length or through the thickness of the board. Now, that's gonna vary a little bit based on how that board is cut. So let's go back to the log, looking at the end of the log, and you'll see all those concentric rings. Moisture exchange is a big, big part of this, right? As, as the wood, as the tree loses moisture or gains moisture, those fibers are going to swell. That log, that circle gets bigger, a larger diameter, or smaller as it loses moisture. So if you were to take that board and inject a bunch of moisture into it, all of those long grain fibers, and a good way to think about this is like a series of straws, uh, or a broom, if you will, all those little fibers in a broom. I like to think of straws because maybe I'm thirsty right now. Um, that and the fact that straws are a good analogy because that's how moisture moves through the tree. It goes up those long grain fibers. So if you grab a handful of straws and you you know, fill them with, with water, those straws will start to expand. Fill them with enough water and they start to expand wider and wider and wider and wider. Well, as they expand, the rings start to grow 
that, that diameter, right, of the tree starts to grow wider because each one of those rings is essentially getting a larger and larger diameter to it. When you cut the tree apart into a board, now we've got, um, actually, let me back up. So we're, again, we're looking at the log, we're looking at those concentric rings. The other structure you have to play with in there is called the medullary ray. The medullary ray is like spokes on a wheel. So looking at those concentric circles, the growth rings on the end of the tree, now start running spokes into the center, from the outside of the tree into the center. And the medullary rays are essentially nutrient transport. Those long grain fibers, those straws, bring the moisture, bring the nutrients up from the soil, and the sugars and all that stuff is brought into the sapwood to, to nourish the tree. Once the tree has the nourishment that it needs, or the waste material that it doesn't need is transported into the center of the tree via the medullary rays, those spokes that run perpendicular to those growth rings, or at least, yeah, perpendicular to the growth rings. In other words, it's the poop chute. <laughs> that's, that's where the tree waste is going. And this is why heartwood is darker than sapwood because the waste material is taken from the sapwood where the living tree is and transported into the center of the tree. The heartwood is not a living part of the tree. The heartwood for all intents and purposes is dead. It is a waste repository, which is also why you will find that heartwood has a different color and it is harder than the sapwood. Certainly there's a higher moisture content in sapwood, but as the tree is dried and the moisture content comes into equilibrium, you will still find that the heartwood is harder than the sapwood because there's just a lot more gunk. There's a higher density, there's just a lot more extractive, there's a lot more waste material in that part of the tree. So think of those medullary rays as like a skeleton, as the structure, the steel girders that are holding this, this, um, this skyscraper together. So when we take that log and we saw it into a board and you can have flats on, you can have quarter sawn, and you can have riffs on boards. Flats on boards are what we're most uh, used to. You know, those boards with the large cathedral patterns down the middle of the board. And when you look at the end grain of the board, you'll see a series of concentric rings. You know, they'll be either, depending on which direction you're looking at, they'll be smiley faces or they'll be frowny faces. They'll be convex or concave, depending on how scientific you want to be. Those, the curvature that we're seeing there, those are the growth rings. And as those growth rings expand and contract, the width of the board grows or lessens with that. The expansion and contraction across its thickness on a flats on board is limited because those medullary rays add a great deal of rigidity, rigid structure. Again, think of steel girders in a building. Think of studs in a wall. They're adding structure and, and anti-racking and everything to that wall. And it really restricts the wood from expanding and contracting across its thickness. Now, when you have a quarter sawn board, those growth rings are actually running perpendicular to the face, to the wider face of the board, and the medullary rays are actually running across the width. Now, we like quarter sawn because it's a more stable piece. Those medullary rays, that structure is preventing the board from expanding and contracting across its width, or it's restricting it. It's still expanding and contracting, but to a much, much less degree. And the board, as it expands and contracts due to moisture, is actually growing in thickness or reducing in thickness, because that's the direction that the growth rings are expanding. So that's what I mean by anisotropic. Those medullary rays are restricting that movement tangent or, or, or radially from the center of the log. So the board is going to move much less in the radial plane than it will in the tangential plane. Flats on boards, the width you're looking at is the tangential plane. Radi uh, quarter sawn boards, the width of the board you're looking at is the radial plane. Rifts on is somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, there's the, and if you look at the end, you'll see those growth rings are at about 45 degrees. So you're kind of in the middle there. It's kind of like, you know, a butt joint is all end grain and an edge joint is all edge grain and a miter joint is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so it's, it's important to understand that anisotropic nature. And that's what throws a lot of people off is because now if you've got a board that is joined to another board and the growth rings are perpendicular to one another, you have a cross grain conundrum. 
one board wants to move across its width, but it's restrained by the radial or the long grain plane of the board that's joined to it. And that's where things can start to go awry. That's where things can start to crack and buckle and, and cup and cause problems because of that prevention of the wood movement. So anytime you have a cross grain situation, you need to restrict that board but allow for the move, move, movement. If you're taking uh, a shelf into a sideboard and you're in a cross grain situation, use a dado or a sliding dovetail to allow that board to expand and contract without being you know, frozen in place by the cross grain of the side. A thousand and one examples there, and this is why I say bringing things into context are gonna be really, really important. So I like to think of it in terms of swelling and shrinking because of moisture gain or moisture loss. Those little straws, those fibers, and those straws can be, and when I talk about straws, I'm not referring to the pores of hardwood. That's a, the, they're there, there's no doubt, and the pores will certainly bring moisture up. But in, uh, what was it last episode or a couple episodes ago, um, I've talked uh, a couple times, I've talked about gravity drying, and I've talked about this in the Renaissance Woodworker as well. When you gravity dry a board, you stand it up and just let the free water run out, that's the pores are filled with free water. But the cell walls themselves are also filled with water. And those cell walls, those individual long grain strands, those are the little straws that I'm talking about. How those straws are oriented together um, and where the pores are, where the dead space in between those straws are, is a whole other layer of structure, whether it's ring porous, diffuse porous, semi-ring porous, or it's a tracheid organization like you have in softwoods, which is the other thing that will lend to the anisotropic nature as well as the variable movement from one species to another. You know, walnut's got a tangential movement of about 8%. Cherry has a tangential movement of about 6%. Ipe has a tangential movement of, well, what is it? Four, 4.2%? 4 um, you know, they're all gonna vary from one to another. Well, why is that? It's because of how the structure, how those fibers are either interlocked together, grown side by side, grown um, in, in concentric rings with early and late growth groupings like you would have in a ring porous or very little early and late growth grouping like you would have in diffuse porous. The pores themselves can be large, can be small, can be double, can be triple. All of those various structural elements are going to affect how much that wood moves tangentially or how much the wood moves radially. And this is important to understand. Each species is going to have um, a, a movement percentage that's associated with it or a coefficient, a movement coefficient would be associated with it if you want to get really, really technical. And you can actually look up the movement coefficients. The Forest Products Laboratory publishes all this stuff and you can do all kinds of math and stuff. And yeah, <laughs> I don't like to do that when I'm in my shop. I just like to think in terms of percentages. So that's the next thing you have to think about when you're looking at you know, go to go to the wood database, go to any book uh, on on wood movement, and you'll see tangential number will be listed as a percentage, six percent. Radial number will be listed as you know a percentage, two percent. And a lot of times you'll see a TR ratio, and that's the ratio of tangential to radial movement. The closer that ratio is to one, the more isotropic that particular species is. The more it's going to move equally in all directions. And, and wood, by its very nature, is anisotropic, but there are some species that are more isotropic than others. And likewise, some species that are way anisotropic. You know, their TR ratio is like three to one. Um, but then you get a species like Ipe, a great tropical decking wood. It's, it's you know, renowned for itself as, as a decking wood, not just because it's really hard, because it's incredibly stable. It has a TR ratio of like 1.08. It's almost isotropic, meaning that its tangential percentage movement and its radial percentage movement are almost equal. It moves more tangentially, but not much more than it does radially. This makes it very stable. Now, stable does not mean it doesn't move. It's still moving, but it's moving equally across the thickness and across its width. And because of that, you don't get distortion, warping, twist, and cupping that occurs because it's, it's restrained in one direction and allowed to move in another direction, the anisotropic nature of it. Because Ipe is more isotropic, it's going to buckle less. It's going to cup less. It's just gonna stay flatter, easier, because it's moving more evenly across 
um, all of its dimensions. So paying attention to that TR ratio is something that can really, really help you. And you can see as I'm building a, a table out of beech or I'm building a table out of walnut and you see the percentage numbers and you can see, okay, well, beech is actually moving more than walnut. So I need to account for a little bit more movement in the structure that I'm building. But then you can also look at the TR ratio and see that beech is wildly anisotropic and walnut is just mildly anisotropic. So walnut is going to be more stable than, than beech just because of that TR ratio. Understanding that TR ratio, you know, it's not going to make you necessarily a better woodworker if you have all the TR ratios memorized, but it is something to think about because really what it comes down to is I'm building something and I need to figure out how much I need to account for the wood movement. And wood movement is a percentage game. You know, a six inch wide board, it's still going to move 6%, but a 24 inch wide board is also going to move 6%. And 6% of 24 is a lot more than 6% of six. Well, it's actually four times more. <laughs> hey, math. So that's the other thing to really pay attention to is how much is my particular piece going to move in this particular situation? And how do I restrain the board in order to keep it flat. In most cases, that's what we're talking about. We're wanting to keep something flat. Or how do I prevent it from fighting the other pieces in this particular furniture or this wall or whatever it is I'm building because of the cross grain situation that I'm, that I'm forcing upon it. So wood movement is something that never stops. It will lessen over time um, as wood becomes acclimated to its surroundings. And as wood ages, you know, you, you can get 300 year old barn wood next to freshly cut barn wood, dry them to the same moisture content, and you will still see the fresh cut board want to move more readily than that 300 year old wood. Well, why is that? This goes back to A, the inner structure, and B, the chemical composition of that particular board. So first thing, and we've talked mostly about wood movement in terms of moisture gain and moisture loss. There's also tension in that particular tree. Did that tree grow in an open field and was battered by winds for years and years and years? And as that tree grew, it had to um, kind of jigger its structure and weave its structure and twist its fibers in order to make it more stable against the high wind. Or Say that tree grew on a hillside and it was constantly fighting gravity, wanted to pull it down in one direction. You'll see a lot of times the pith is slightly off center. The pith again is the center of the tree. You'll see that pith is a little off center because we've seen uneven growth uphill and down then downhill because of that tension that's on that board all the time. This becomes very apparent when you start looking at branch wood, you know, branch wood growing perpendicular and, and has all that cantilevered weight due to gravity is going to be under a lot more tension than the, the, the vertical bowl, the vertical trunk of the tree. There's a thousand and one other things that can affect the tension in that particular board just on how it grew and what um, factors or, 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 or elements it was subjected to during its life. So once you start cutting up a log into boards, you can be cutting across tension lines and you can kind of be snapping rubber bands that were in tension and something that maybe was in tension and holding it flat, holding that fiber, that long grain fiber, nice and taut and flat, once the tension is pulled off of it, that fiber is allowed to kind of grow lax and start to curl up a little bit. And this can cause twist. There's no doubt that twist can also be caused by moisture, but you know, sometimes you've got a, a kiln dried board that still has a lot of movement going on to it, especially as you start to cut it because there's tension being released. And this again, when I talk about, you know, you can't, you can have an idea of how wood moves, but sometimes you just have to throw your hands up and go, crap, <laughs> I don't know what just happened because you can't possibly begin to anticipate all of the tension issues that pop up. You can predict some of them just by looking at the ingrain, looking at the fibers, looking, if you saw that tree and saw how it was growing, you can predict some tension issues in it. You can also have tension caused by improper drying, the whole case hardening thing. That's a whole other issue. I've certainly talked about case hardening in the past, but it's yet another aspect that's going to affect the quote stability in quote of a board. You know, if you're sawing a board on a table saw and you start to see it 
splitting apart on the other side of the blade, curving away, you are releasing tension on that board as you make that cut. Or the, the worst, the opposite, it starts curving back on it. Hopefully you've got a splitter in place so it's not gonna kick back on you, but still, you know, you can make a rip cut and have it come off the saw and be perfectly straight and then come back an hour later and that board has side bend to it because some tension has been released while making that cut. This becomes more and more obvious two scenarios. The more of the log that you have, so if you have a log and you break it down into a square cant, and then maybe you break it into four pieces and you've got these eight by eights that you're using for timber framing. Well, an eight by eight has more more of the log, more of the tension that's there, but you've still cut some of the outer parts around it. And it's going to behave a little bit more like a tree. And it's going to be some of that tension release and, and deformation of that particular blank is gonna be more obvious because you've got more bound up tension in that particular log. As you begin to cut that eight by eight down into smaller parts, you're, you're snipping the tension lines in enough places that a lot of times you're, you're much better off. As you, as you start breaking it into smaller, smaller pieces, the tension goes away and you don't have that kind of movement on you until you get to a point where you start cutting it so thin that the long grain fibers don't have enough strength to hold themselves rigid against the release or, or addition of tension on that board. So if you take a really thick board and you rip off a tiny little strip, you will find that that strip will start to deform very, very quickly. Now, a lot of that is due to the moisture exchange in that particular board, but it's, it's twofold. Certainly there's a lot of moisture as you rip off that thin strip from a larger piece, but there's also a lot less internal structure in that thin piece to hold it rigid much, much longer. So, you know, so that tiny little sliver is undergoing massive amount of tension because of the moisture exchange, the uneven moisture exchange, and there's not enough rigidity or enough structural fibers in that thin strip to hold it flat anymore. So it begins to cup due to the moisture movement. But then you're also adding tension to those existing fibers. As they bend in one direction and not the other, you start to add a little bit more tension in. So, you know, sometimes it balances out and you're just fine, but it's the, something to think about is the wood, the wood is always in tension. As we cut it and we it goes through a moisture change, tension is happening. As that moisture begins to equilibrate and come even across the whole board, that tension is actually lessened. So if you've ever seen a situation where you've got a board that's been kiln dried, you rip it and it starts to move because yes, you just exposed the gooey creamy center. So you stack and sticker, you even restrain it, you know, weight it down or whatever, and you come back a couple of days and you check it with a moisture meter and everything's coming to equilibrium and it's like, okay, this is great. We're fine now. And then you, you take off the weights and you start working with it and you come back a day later and that board has started to move again. And you're thinking, what the heck? It's perfectly dry, why is it moving? Well, that's because the board was put into tension as it began to move due to the moisture exchange. As the moisture, the tension brought on by the moisture exchange fell away because the moisture exchange brought it into equilibrium, there's now no tension opposing the tension that you just introduced to the board. You bent it one way due to moisture, now it's gonna bend back and possibly spring back the other way. What this, this makes you wanna throw your hands up and go, why am I even working with wood at all? Because it just sounds like there's no way to keep it flat. This is why we use joinery. This is why we build things out of it. You can keep it flat by restraining it, by joining one thing to another. Take uh, porch flooring and you're running tongue and groove joinery in that porch flooring. And that tongue and groove joinery is really, really, precise, like you've got the tolerance is dialed in and really tight on that. So you, it's a kind of a hammer tight fit along that tongue and groove. Well, if you run that tongue and groove joinery, put it on a bolster somewhere and come back a week later, you are gonna have a hell of a time getting that tongue and groove together. Unless you specifically cut it to be a looser fit, you're gonna see expansion and contraction, but more importantly, you're gonna see side bend, you're gonna see bow along the length. It's gonna make it really, really difficult to line up the tongue and the groove just to hammer together. And you're gonna exert a lot of tension kind of straightening out the bow that you could not possibly snap one of the walls of the groove off or snap off the tongue itself. So how do we prevent that? Well, you run tongue and groove joinery and you assemble it. 
You assemble it like as soon as you possibly can. And then what you're doing is restraining the movement because you've got the interlocking tongue and groove. And it, as the moisture exchange happens, as the tension builds up and lessens, that tongue and groove has locked it together, restraining any potential movement so that the whole thing ends up coming out flat. And the same thing can be said with a board that you just saw on. Well, it may cup on you slightly, but are you gonna be joining that into a case with dovetails? Are you gonna be screwing it down or using hardwood buttons or using a sliding dovetail or something like that to attach it to another structure? That other structure is going to help flatten things out. I'd be willing to bet you if you took a, you know, masterpiece of furniture, something you did everything right, everything came out perfectly square, perfectly flat, and you were able to reverse engineer it. Say you, you just used dry interlocking joints, you know, didn't use any glue whatsoever, and you were able to take the whole thing apart. You took that perfect piece of furniture with no everything flat and everything square, take it apart, set those pieces out independently on your workbench, go away for a couple of weeks and come back. I'd be willing to bet you each one of those perfectly flat boards are gonna have a cup to it. And you know what? If you reassemble it, it may be a little bit more difficult driving everything together because you're gonna to have to flatten out cup. More than likely, that piece will go back together perfectly flat, perfectly square because the joinery itself was helping to hold that in place. And a little bit of tension is actually a really good thing. Look at the temples the Japanese made thousands of years ago. The joinery on that was based around compression. Why? Because there are earthquakes in Japan. <laughs> and as the ground shakes and you've got a joint that's under compression already, it's not going to open up on you. It's not going to loosen as things are flexed because you've already got a bit of tension compressing that board in that half lap or whatever that dovetail joint or whatever it is. The dynamic forces of an earthquake are not going to shake everything loose because you've got a little added extra bit of force due to the tension brought on by compression. So long way to get to the point saying that wood moves not just because of moisture but also because of tension release and tension added because of moisture and because of things that we do to it making a joint slightly too small and hammering it into place thousand and one ways that you can make a board move make a board move or have a board move on you the thing to recognize is that it's always going to stop always going to move you can apply finish and that will slow down moisture exchange, but the moisture exchange is not stopped. It's just really slowed down. Now, if you slow it down enough, what you'll find is there may not be any movement whatsoever um, or changes in moisture. You move it from one climate to another or don't really have any effect because the moisture exchange is slowed so much that the board is just kind of gently eased into its new environment. Um, you know, in sealing does the same thing to a lesser degree. Certainly, finishing, uh, you know, will will encase. I don't even want to say encase. Coat the entire board in in a vapor barrier that's going to slow down that moisture exchange. If you think about nothing else, think about the fact that wood is always going to move, and every time you join one board to another, think about how are these boards going to move, and assume the worst. Assume they're gonna move a hell of a lot and build your joinery to account for that. Or if you're in a certain situation where I need to make sure this stays flat, well, how am I going to restrain that piece to keep it flat despite the most radical moisture changes possible? You know, you, you, it would be nice if you could think everything is going to be in a perfectly climate controlled situation and I don't have to worry about movement because there's going to be no moisture exchange whatsoever. Well, go back to the point that I just said about tension buildup. There's always going to be some movement. There's no way around that. So build to account for a lot of movement. Account for the worst in your building and this is never something that's going to really be an issue. Now. The other thing you have to think about are the environmental concerns and not just, you know, really, really harsh environmental concerns like exterior furniture or exterior decking or siding where you've got one side that's totally in shade all the time or one side that's up against the house in siding and the other side is getting baked in the sun or one wall of a house is southern facing and the other wall is northern facing and try to get those corners to line up, you know, obviously it's never going to work, right? You're always going to have that southern facing full sun exposure is always going to to shrink a lot more because it's going to bake and bake it drier. And the the western wall, the eastern wall that's directly adjacent to that is not going to be the same. So your courses of siding are going to be really difficult to line up around the corners. 
which is why a lot of times you will often see a trim piece that's running vertically that kind of covers those corners and it disguises the fact that those courses of shingles, courses of siding don't line up every time of the year. Breadboard on a table, it's, it's gonna be flush maybe twice a year. The rest of the time, the breadboard's probably gonna be proud. Um, usually we try to do it so the breadboard stays proud and the table shrinks inside the breadboard. Uh, personally, I think that looks better. I also think that it's gonna cause less, um, less chance of damaging things if the breadboard stays proud. But regardless, it's only flush a couple times a year when it passes through that, whatever that movement was when you actually assembled that breadboard. You know, maybe you put it together in the spring, it's gonna be flush. And then in the fall, when you get that same transition period, it's gonna be flush again. In the middle of the winter, it's not gonna be flush. In the middle of summer, it's not gonna be flush. It's just the way things are. It's always gonna move, but the idea of a breadboard is to help keep that table flat. We're restraining that table. So many things can can cause that wood to move that it really, it's kind of a, a useless exercise to try to a, think about stopping the movement. B, try to unravel why it's moving. The important part is, what do you need it to do? I need this to be flat. I don't care if this is flat. I need this to just be flush with this. Well, think about the important things that you need in whatever it is you're building and alter your construction techniques in order to allow the wood to move while still saying flat, still saying flush, whatever it is that you're looking for in that particular instance. And that, that's really, that's all you have to know. Wood's always gonna move, build to compensate for it. We know that wood moves anisotropically. We know that by altering the cut, in other words, altering the, the geometry of those growth rings will give us a board that is, is less movement across its width, but more movement across its thickness. But because wood movement is a percentage game, you know, unless you've got a perfect cube where the thickness is the same as its width, the thickness is gonna be much less generally. You've got a one inch board, you know, six inches wide, that radial plane is going to move very, very little. So if you orient that radial plane across the six inch width, you're gonna have a board that moves very little across six inches, but moves more percentage wise across its thickness. But because the board is only one inch thick, you know, 10% of one inch is still a lot less than 6% of six inches. So this is kind of difficult to, to describe in audio, but I think you guys get the point here. Recognize the anisotropic nature. Recognize you can never stop wood movement. It will slow as the wood gets really old. You know, wood, wood gets old enough and it becomes petrified. <laughs> and then it's not moving because it's not acting like wood anymore because it literally has been replaced with silica. <laughs> it's now stone. That's an extreme example. The hardening of the resins, the release of the tension over time in an older board is going to make it, quote, more stable than a fresh cut one, regardless of moisture. And that was the point that I was trying to make earlier that I don't think I ever landed the plane and made because there's so much to talk about wood movement, right? So now that we've talked about the basics, you guys are either totally with me or you're totally confused, in which case in the next episode, we're going to start talking specifics and we're going to start answering your questions and start throwing things into context and start to get a better feel for how wood movement is going to affect this particular situation. So here again, last call. If you have questions about wood movement, send them to lumberupdate at gmail.com. Go to lumberupdate.com, submit your question via the form, and I'll try to get them onto the show. Until then, folks, whew, wood moves. Get over it.